Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I actually got called out by one of my board members after last Sunday's message because she said that her household was very disappointed when I didn't tell a joke. So I am not going to disappoint anyone this week. I've got a great one for you. Uh, Church one Sunday after a very long and boring sermon, the parishioners filed out of the church saying nothing to the preacher. Now, towards the end of the line, there was a really thoughtful person who always commented on the sermons. She said, Pastor, today your sermon reminded me of the peace and love of God. Now, the pastor, he was absolutely thrilled with this. No one has ever said anything like that about my preaching before. Tell me why. Well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding And the love of God, well, because it endured forever. (laughs) Well, I hope this message uh, makes sense to you this morning, and I hope that you're not bored. But as we jump into this message, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. Uh, First of all, engage with us this morning. If something resonates with you, go ahead and write it down in a notebook or or type it out in the comments. It's, It's like a virtual amen. And also, you can help us out by sharing this stream on your personal profile and plan on being a part of the conversation at the end when we get together to discuss this message. We want to hear from you and we want to interact together. Now, when I planned this sermon series last September, I could not have fathomed that the first week that we're under a stay-home order from the governor because of a pandemic, we'd be talking about this kind of apocalyptic prophecy by Jesus. And if I'm going to be completely honest, uh, I didn't announce the next passage that I was going to preach on last week. I thought about switching it because every time there's a crisis in our world, um, Bible teachers abuse this passage of scripture and make it about something that it never really was intended to be about. So it seemed a little cliche and... uh, That's what I'm teaching on this week. That being said, I'm going to just make the assumption that God knew what he was doing when he gave me this plan. And I haven't deviated from our our plan so far in this series, but we're going to talk about this incredible and a little bit controversial passage of scripture on the internet where nobody ever has anything critical to say. Now, before we get into the text today, I want to share with you this verse from 2 Peter 3.16. And this is Peter talking about the Apostle Paul's writings. I just want you to hear what it says. There are some things in them, in his writings, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do with the other scriptures. You know, some scripture is hard to understand. And over the course of our history, and as early as Peter's time, when he was writing this, people have taken scripture and the fact that it's somewhat ambiguous in places and twisted it for the purpose of promoting their own agenda. And so there are three reasons why I think scripture can be a little bit unclear, as Peter was saying. The first is that it's not unclear, but we really don't want to hear what it actually has to say. Right? There are some things in our life that, that we don't want to acknowledge. There are some things that we don't want to deal with. And there are some things that God says that we don't really like. And so uh, if we want to twist God's word to make it fit what we want it to say, um, that's, that's one explanation for why it's a little bit hard to understand. Uh, a second thing would be that our context has changed. We live uh, thousands of years later than when most of the Bible was written. And so sometimes we don't have the full understanding of everything that was going on in that moment. And it can be hard for us to understand because we don't have the proper context. The third reason is that some scripture was meant to be unclear. Prophetic passages of scripture are by far the most challenging in this way. They're ambiguous. They're hard to understand. And there are so many different views of what this particular passage in Luke means. So I'm going to teach on this passage today, but I'd encourage you to study it for yourself. And maybe you disagree with some of my conclusions, and guess what? That's okay, because studying scripture is hard. I want us to be engaging in the word of God on a regular basis and growing together. 
And when we're growing, uh, we, we're going to read through this passage and, and we're going to take it chunk by chunk and talk about it as we go. Before we start, I want us to look through this bifocal lens, really. And what I mean by that is we need to understand that Jesus was prophesying both for the very near future, what would happen about 30 years after this occasion, and in the long range as well. There's both included in this passage of scripture. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 21, and we're going to read through this together chunk by chunk. So Luke 21, and starting at verse 5. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, as for these things that you see, the day will come where there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So Jesus is in the temple just like he was last week. And and you need to understand the history of this temple. Now, the original temple building was constructed by Solomon. Uh, It was prepared for by David, and that was eventually destroyed by enemies. When Israel was taken into captivity, they were led out of captivity, and Ezra led the, the project of rebuilding the temple. Now, it was less glorious than the original construction. In fact, the Bible tells us that some of the older people that were there who remembered what the temple was like, wept when the foundation was laid. Um, they, they knew that, that it wasn't what it originally was, but that temple too that they rebuilt was, init- was eventually destroyed as well. And just prior to the time of Jesus, about 20 years before he was born, that temple had been rebuilt by a man named Herod the Great. He took the ruins of what was there previously, doubled the the footprint and created a magnificent temple. Now, there is not a building in the world today that has as much meaning as that building meant to the Jews. It was a masterpiece. So they were admiring its beauty and and Jesus says, it's going to be destroyed. This is a huge deal to them. Let's keep reading in verse seven. And when they asked him, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place. And he said, See that you're not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So Jesus is telling us not to be led astray. Don't be led astray. Now, notice that they don't doubt or question what Jesus says, right? He has credibility with these people and they accept as fact his prophecy here. But they don't ask if, they ask when. And Jesus is basically saying, you're asking the wrong question. Jesus is saying this temple, this thing right here is just one event. The destruction of this temple is just one event in a bigger story. And for years, People have been trying to predict the second coming ever since then or or the end of civilization. And here's the crazy thing. When they're wrong, they just do it again. And people still listen to them, right? I mean, there's about 45 different uh, past predictions of Christ's second coming listed on Wikipedia and about another six that are future dates. And there are many more predictions of the end of the world Now, here are just a few of the highlights, just to give you an idea. Uh, Hippolytus, Sextus, Julius, Africanus, and Irenaeus predicted that Jesus would return in 500 AD based on the dimensions of the ark. Makes sense, right? Then there was Pope Sylvester II. He said 1000 AD. And then when that didn't happen, he was like, well, maybe it's 1033 because it's a thousand years after Christ's death and resurrection. Um, moving forward a little bit, Emanuel Swedenborg 
uh, predicted his second coming in 1757. And this one I didn't know. John Wesley actually predicted it in 1836. Charles Taze Russell, uh, you may know him as the, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, said it would happen in 1874. And Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon faith, said it would be within his lifetime that Jesus would return. He's dead now. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses predicted it again in, the 19, in 1914. Harold Camping in 1994. Jerry Falwell uh, said it would happen by 2009. Uh, Harold Camping again predicted it in 2011. And uh, Jack Van Impey said ah, it could happen sometime around 2012. Now, some of these guys are nuts. Some of them were great figures in our church history, like Irenaeus and John Wesley. Those are important guys to us and godly men. And, and I still even hear to this day, well-meaning Christians saying, Jesus must be coming soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but he didn't say we don't know the year or the month. Look at all the signs that are happening right now. Look at everything that's going on. And then they reference Luke 21. But Jesus in this passage is saying, don't buy this, right? Verse 9 says that when you hear of wars and tumults, don't be terrified for these things must take place, but the end will not be at once. I believe the reason that the second coming of Christ is a mystery to us is to keep us focused on our mission while we're here on this earth. We don't need any extra distractions. We have enough already. In fact, I heard one pastor say it this way. We're invited to be on the welcoming committee for Jesus, not the planning committee, right? Uh, that's why it's so important that we approach studying scripture with humility, if I had a dollar for every prophecy conference that I've been invited to over the last few years where someone has finally unlocked the code to understanding how modern day events are the fulfillment of scripture, I'd have enough money to attend one of those conferences, right? If God wanted us to know exactly how future events were going to play out, he would have spelled it out for us in scripture. He would have told us directly himself. But the ambiguity there lets us know that God doesn't want us to have all the details. And now we can study and imagine and marvel as it unfolds, as it unfolds in front of us. I came across an article just this week on CNN about a psychic named Sylvia Brown who's predicting the return of Christ in 2020. And of course, everything that we're experiencing right now is evidence that her prediction is true. So after the temple is destroyed, uh, there will be more war, natural disasters, famines, and pandemics. Jesus was saying that when the coronavirus hits, don't freak out and say the end is near. This is the world that we live in. We have all these things because we live in a sinful and broken world. And now in order to fully understand this passage, we need a little bit more background information. So here's a little history lesson. Uh, Israel at Jesus' time, about 33 AD, was under Roman occupation. And in 66 AD, 33 years later, there would be a Jewish revolt against the Roman emperor. Now, Rome did not tolerate revolts. They made an example of anyone who would rebel against the emperor. And there's a great documentary on the story of Masada, if you want to learn a little bit more about this. Uh, but they put the whole city under siege. And when they surrendered, they burned Jerusalem to the ground, destroying the temple completely, just as Jesus said it would happen. So Jesus is saying, don't freak out when you see stuff like this happening. This story is just beginning. Now, I'll come back to that, but let's keep reading in Luke chapter 21. Pick it up in verse 12. And before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons, and you will be brought before the kings and governors for my name's sake. So following Jesus isn't easy, right? In addition to everything else that's going on in the world, he promises there will be persecution. Now, we face some persecution in our nation today. Um, maybe people might lose their job for their faith. They might be cut off from relationships. Um, but 
in the world today, there's real persecution that is happening. There are people that are being uh, punished and tortured and even killed for their faith. In fact, uh, Nick and I were looking the other day at a site called opendoorusa.org. Uh, it ranks countries based on their level of persecution. There are parts of the world today where the church is facing incredible persecution, where people are cut off from their society, where they're kicked out of their home. They're even thrown into prison and killed because of their faith. So if all of this is just part of the world that we live in, then how do we respond? Well, Jesus is saying, first of all, don't worry. Don't worry about the signs and predicting the future. That's the wrong question to ask. Rather, when this stuff happens, here's what you do. Let's, let's pick it up in verse 13. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. I love that. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict And you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. And you will be hated for my name's sake. But not a hair on your head will perish. And by your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now, this is a powerful statement from Jesus. He's saying, don't panic when you see crazy things happen in your world. Uh, This isn't a moment to be fearful. This is an opportunity. This is your chance. When the world around you is freaking out, you already have the answer to what they're looking for. This is an opportunity for us as the church to bring people to the hope that comes through Jesus Christ. Some of the greatest opportunities often come out of the greatest tragedies. Uh, Then he goes on to say something strange. He says, don't even plan what you're going to say. He's like, I'll give you the wisdom that you need. That's so amazing. You don't even have to worry about what you're going to say in response to the faith that you have in your heart. When that time of crisis comes, Jesus has promised that he himself will help us out. And then he says something that kind of seems like a contradiction. He says, some of you will be put to death But then he goes on to say, not a hair on your head will perish. What he's really saying here is that they might kill you, but they can't take your soul. Right? Here's the crazy part about this story. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, something incredible happened. The church, which to this point was primarily still in Jerusalem, was forced to flee. And by this evil act of of invading Jerusalem, the greatest missionary movement of the world began. The greatest movement the world has ever seen. What happened, the Romans came into the city and the church had to leave. They scattered to every corner of the earth and the gospel was taken forward. You see, God isn't in the business of doing evil things, but he is in the business of taking what was meant for evil and turning it for good. Now, Jesus will go on to say in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you're going to know that its desolation is near. And remember, this is about 30 years before this actually happened. And he talks about all the horrible things that will happen. But then he leaves us with this hope. And we're going to skip down to verse 25 in this passage of scripture. Luke 21, 25. And this is so amazing. It says, And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and waves, people fainting with fear, with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory And now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your head because your redemption is drawing near. Isn't that an incredible truth? Isn't that incredible hope from Jesus? Like we can focus on all the different things that are going on in our world around us. We can focus on all the struggles that we have, 
or we can set our focus on Jesus because when he comes again, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be glorious. And we're going to have all eternity to spend with him. There's hope in that. Regardless of what you believe today about the second coming of Christ, and I know that there's a huge variety of beliefs, even with the people who are watching today, I think we can agree on on this principle. Let's live our life like he's coming back tomorrow. We can plan like he's coming back in 10,000 years, but let's live our life like he's coming back today, right? Even tomorrow isn't guaranteed. But with Christ, we have hope. If you're a Christian today, there's urgency to share your faith with the people that God has placed in your life. We don't know how long that we have. Now, if you're listening to this today and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, in just a second, I want to give you an opportunity to do that in the form of a prayer. I'm going to lead that prayer, and I'd encourage you to pray that with me and invite Jesus into your life. And if you're here today and you know Jesus as your Savior, you don't have to worry about what's coming. You don't have to fear the future. You don't have to fear the events that are going on in our world today. We have hope because of what he's done for us. Would you join me in, in praying this prayer together? And, and maybe you're praying it for the first time today. This could be the greatest decision of your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for us. Thank you for the hope that comes through Jesus Christ. Today, we, we come before you and acknowledge that we need you that we need your grace, that we need your love. So Lord, we admit that we are sinful and that we can't do it on our own, that our hope uh, isn't in ourselves because we know that we're broken. But in our sin and in our failure, Lord, we come to you right now, a broken people saying we need your hope. So Lord, we admit that we need you right now come in to my life today. Make me a new creation like your word says. I repent of my sin. I'm turning from my old life and placing my life in your hands today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time this morning, tell somebody about it. We want to know. You can either comment below on this thread Um, You can email me at paul at West Point, or we have a link in our uh, comment section. It's westpoint.org slash yes. And and if you just click on that, you can let us know that you made that decision. And we have some great resources that will help you in this journey in your new life with Christ. Now, we're going to move on to some group discussion here in just a minute. But I want to, I'm going to put a couple of discussion questions up on the screen And you can answer those questions with your family at home. And then what we'd like you to do is take your answers and and just post them right in the comment section. And we're going to come back in about five minutes and talk about some of those answers together and share some of those things. Number your answers, one, two, or three, so we know which question you're answering. That'll be easier for us. And give a, we'll give you about five minutes to do this before we start a discussion time. And then after we have that discussion time, we're going we're gonna to have some worship here. And we're going to ask you to join us in singing some songs this morning as well.